The investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch is beyond any reasonable dispute, one of the two or three most accomplished, important, and courageous journalists of his generation. Very, very few journalists on the planet, and virtually none, who still work inside the nation's largest media corporations can even get close to him when it comes to having broken more major history-changing stories. Perhaps one of the few is Julian Assange, who is not working within a major media outlet, but instead is languish languishing in a high-security prison in Belmarsh in London. Hirsch is an old school reporter in the best sense of the word. When he began his career as a journalist, the internet did not exist, nor, except in the most negligible ways, did independent media. And yet, he somehow managed to always straddle the line between independence and working inside the nation's largest outlets. He began by working simultaneously in the 1950s as a copy boy and police reporter for a local Chicago paper and a clerk at the Walgreens drugstore illustrating that that was when journalism was still a working class profession. He then spent several years as a reporter at Associated Press in the early 60s until he quit in protest when his editors tried to water down one of his stories. He then went to Vietnam and covered the war as a freelance reporter. In 1969, he heard about an army lieutenant, William Calley, who had been secretly court-martialed for his role in a massacre of Vietnamese civilians. And after investigating it, all as a freelance reporter, he broke the news of what became globally, globally known as the My Lai Massacre, in which he wrote, quote, the Army says Lieutenant Calley deliberately murdered at least 109 Vietnamese civilians during a search and destroy mission in March 1968 in a Viet Cong stronghold known as Pinkville. Hirsch's story was picked up by 33 newspapers through the wire service. He was working as a freelance reporter when he revealed it. That incident took place in March 1968 and it involved the deliberate killing by Company C, 1st Battalion, 20th Infantry of South Vietnamese civilians. The U.S. Army originally denied all of his claims, insisting that they were all made up and were all fiction. But they ultimately end up admitting most of his, his revelations, including the fact that Lieutenant Calley was convicted of murder of 22 civilians and was sentenced to life in prison, though he was pardoned in 1974. For that reporting, which prompted not some mean tweets, but threats of all kinds of violence from many serious left sectors, Hearst won the 1970 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. After that My Lai scoop, which helped change how Americans thought about the war in Vietnam, he was hired as a staff reporter by The New Yorker, where he worked for the next 22 years, from 1971 until 1993, and he continued to publish many stories with The New Yorker up until 2017. During his career, Hirsch, in addition to that Pulitzer, won the George Polk Award for investigative reporting, the second most prestigious award in journalism, a total of five times. The fifth being when he exposed many of the worst abuses at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq in 2004, which resulted in the discipline and court-martialing of numerous U.S. service members. He covered Watergate, the secret bombing campaign in Cambodia, and in 2003 he won a National Magazine Award for his reporting on how Dick Cheney and neocons in the Bush administration were manipulating intelligence and manufacturing all sorts of propaganda and then disseminating it to the nation's largest media outlets. Hearst was always an unconventional reporter, an oddball, someone who never really fit into the glamorous and chic DC salons in which more polished insiders like Bob Woodward and the new glittering network news stars that anchor the news so comfortably thrived and found celebrity and great riches. He was combative and disheveled and most importantly, far more interested in undermining and subverting official state propaganda than peddling it. And for that reason, he has long been hated in Washington circles because he was known for his refusal to play ball, an attribute which decades ago was the hallmark, hallmark for being a good journalist, but which in the era of corporatized media will be career ending the first chance they get to ha get rid of you. Hirsch is being spoken of again this week because he has a blockbuster news story that purports to describe in painstaking detail what many people, I would suggest most rational people, already believe. Namely, that it was not Russia which blew up its own Nord Stream pipeline, a project long vital to Moscow, 
as it allows the Russians to sell large amounts of cheap natural gas to Western Europe through Germany and gives the Kremlin significant leverage over Euro European nations, making it very bizarre to think that they would blow up their own pipeline. But instead, instead says Hirsch, it was the U.S. security state that destroyed it. In an article this week on Substack, under the headline, quote, How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline, the New York Times called it a mystery, but the United States, he says, executed a covert sea operation that was kept secret until now. Hearst describes that, quote, last June, the Navy divers operating under the cover of a widely publicized midsummer NATO exercise known as Ball Tops 22, Ball Tops, planted the remotely triggered explosives that, three months later, destroyed three of the four Nord Stream pipelines, according to a source with direct knowledge of the operational planning. Now, when Hirsch sought comment about that story from both the Bush, Biden White House and the CIA, both of them denied that story with unusual, I would say, suspicious vehemence. From Hersha's story, quote, asked for comment, Adrian Watson, a White House spokesperson, said in an email, quote, this is false and complete fiction. Tammy Thorpe, a spokesperson for the CIA, similarly wrote, quote, this claim is completely and utterly false. Now, what makes all of this so remarkably interesting is that this is what Seymour Hersh has done his entire career. He has cultivated relationships deep inside the CIA and in the intelligence community of essentially dissident intelligence operatives, people who object to and dissent from the prevailing orthodoxy of the CIA, who believe the CIA is constantly lying to the public and often use Hirsch to get the truth out. And so while he does rely on anonymous sources and did rely on at least one anonymous source for this story, perhaps more, but I think there's a suggestion that it's only one, even though I'm not comfortable with anonymity, that is what anonymity is for, not for way, the way the mainstream media uses it, which is to give cover to operatives inside the government to tell the media what the government wants the media to tell the public. That's propaganda. No one needs anonymity for that, even though that's how it's often given. Anonymity is to protect employees inside the government who tell reporters things the government wants concealed, not that they want disseminated. And that's what Seymour Hersh has always done. Most of his stories, including the ones that are so widely awarded and praised, have been built on the back of that tactic and his relationships that nobody denies he has deep in the bowels of most of these buildings in Washington. Now, one of the things that's remarkable about Seymour Hersh's story is... Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.